When people think about what it takes to make and keep people healthy, they most often think of doctors and nurses, clinics and hospitals, and health plans and insurance companies. Sometimes they think of their own behaviors, like what they smoke, eat, and drink, and how much they exercise, or not. Seldom do they think of lawyers and laws and public policies as important to their health. But surprisingly, some of the greatest advances in health have come about because of the work of lawyers and others focused on policies, laws, and regulations. We're going to learn about the importance of the practice of law in improving the health of the public on today's episode of A Public Health Journal. Please stay tuned. Welcome to A Public Health Journal, a program that explores public health issues facing our society today and tomorrow. The host of the show is Dr. Ed Ellinger, Commissioner of Health for the State of Minnesota. A Public Health Journal is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health, and the Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department, all working together towards the goal of healthy people living in healthy communities. Welcome to A Public Health Journal. Today we're going to look at the field of public health law and how it can significantly contribute to improving the health of Minnesotans and all Americans. In particular, we'll be looking at the work of the Public Health Law Center, where a team of attorneys and other professionals help community leaders use public policies to improve the nation's health. Joining me in that conversation is Doug Blanke, founder and director of the Public Health Law Center at the William Mitchell College of Law. The Public Health Law Center is now focusing most of its work on tobacco control, healthy eating, and encouraging physical activity. Doug, welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, people really think about you know, doctors and nurses and clinics and hospitals. How, give us a little framework of how does public health law fit into improving the health of the public? How do attorneys actually help uh, people be healthier? Well, that's right. When you think about protecting your health, lawyers are probably the last people that you think of. But for those of us who practice law in the field of public health, um, there's a certain irony to that because law has really been integral to public health since the very earliest days. For lawyers who work in this area, the most important legal case is a case called the Jacobson case, which was decided more than a hundred years ago by the Supreme Court of the United mm. States. And that case involved the question whether public health authorities could require that people get vaccinated against um, smallpox. And in that case, the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts was requiring vaccinations, and a gentleman by the name of Jacobson insisted that this should be a matter of personal responsibility and choice. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, which said that, no, the decision whether to be vaccinated against smallpox was more than an individual decision, that if he weren't vaccinated and if others took that approach, the uh, well-being of the entire community would be jeopardized. And so it was that legal ruling that provides kind of the underpinnings for much of public health. If you um, were then to look over the last hundred years and the things that the CDC says were the the greatest accomplishments of public health over that time, you would find that every single one of them involves some element of public policy. Like, for example? <clears throat> well, an example would be uh, workplace safety. So if we think about Minnesota a hundred years ago and what it was like to work in the mines of the Iron Range or the flour mills of Minneapolis and how dangerous those working conditions were, eventually we decided we needed public policy to do something about mm. that to have inspections in the mines and safety equipment in the auto factories and so on. And um, those issues continue today with things like repetitive stress injuries in the meatpacking industry or carpal tunnel syndrome in um, office workplaces. But again, it's based in law. Or another good example would be highway safety. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, we want people to exercise good judgment when they drive their cars. But if we didn't have a seat belt in the car, you wouldn't really have many options for buckling up. And so we have seat belts and child safety seats and airbags, and we've gotten serious about um, drinking and driving and so on. So all of these are legal interventions designed to improve public health. So um, from that perspective, law has always been part of public health. Has there, ever been, has there been a specialty of public health law practice for it's, a long period of time? Um, it's really been very much a niche area of the law, and that's one of the things that we're working at now is trying to build that out and draw more people into this field. And there are several forces going on in society that are kind of converging to make concern about law and policy more central to the entire approach in public health. 
One um, factor that contributes to that is that as we've had greater success in addressing infectious diseases, which were once the leading problems of health, um, more and more of the issues of health in this country have focused on chronic disease. And so factors like or um, health outcomes like cancer and coronary heart disease and diabetes and lung disease now make up the great majority of the attention of our health care system. And as we focus on those problems, we see that the best responses are preventative responses that involve changing the environment in which we all live and work to help us live lives that will prevent those diseases. So when you put those factors together, it has made a focus on um, public policies and changing the systems in which we live and operate and changing the legal environment, really kind of one of the starting places. Yeah, for well, I, I know you, you brought a, a slide, I'm gonna put this up on, on the screen, that shows sort of the levels of intervention and, and I think it'll be instructive to folks as you looked at, at the slide about uh, how some of the, the things at the bottom of the pyramid have a much bigger impact than the things at the top. And maybe you could walk us through this, this slide explaining a little bit about the, the concept of public health law and how it really impacts the health of a lot of people. Well, this is an interesting slide that's been developed by the Centers for Disease Control to illustrate some of the trends that I was just talking about. And um, we were interested when they came out with this because we thought, oh, this really describes what we are about at the Public Health Law Center. This diagram really kind of resembles the old food pyramid that we're all familiar with, but what it illustrates is the different types of approaches that we can take to public health problems, ranging from those that are focused more on the one-by-one -one individual approach. Those are at the top of the pyramid. And as you go down the pyramid, you move toward alternative approaches that affect more people more efficiently and in a more long-lasting and sustainable way. So if you look at the pyramid, you would see kind of the old school classic approach that would say, if someone has um, high cholesterol, the thing to do is try to convince each person one by one to change the way they live. Progressing from that, though, as we've developed clinical interventions, um, high cholesterol medications, if you can get someone on the medicine and, and get them to be compliant and take the medicine, you can have a high confidence that there will be a benefit as opposed to just giving them a, a little um, education. verbal in yeah. education. But if we can move farther down the pyramid to a more lasting intervention, sometimes we can find uh, something that can be done in a clinical setting that will have a sustainable lifelong effect. If we can help someone quit smoking, mm -hmm. for example, with um, cessation therapies, or if we get them that immunization so they never get the disease. But even better than those clinical interventions are those that change the entire context in which someone lives and works and goes to school and so on. So, for example, if people are consuming a lot of trans fats that cause coronary um, heart disease, and if there really aren't any countervailing reasons why we should be eating trans fats, it's not that people go to a restaurant demanding to have something yeah, with that taste, trans fats, tasty, tasty trans fat. Uh, and since there are other alternatives that taste just as good and are actually much better for you, if we can just get the restaurants to take those out altogether, mm -hmm. then we've addressed the problem systemically. And if we can get smoking out of our restaurants and bars, we've addressed the problem systemically. So that just a year ago, the Mayo Clinic came out with a new study um, looking at data in Olmsted County that demonstrated that when a community goes smoke-free, you see heart attacks in that community go down by 40%, mm -hmm. just like that, yeah. from going smoke-free. So these are the kinds of interventions that we work on at the Public Health Law Center with the ultimate goal of changing the way we, um, the way we all think as a society, what goes into the culture. So I mentioned earlier uh, drinking and driving as a problem. Well, well that, we're gonna, we, I want to get into some of those specific things, and, but first we need to take a little break and then we'll come back and talk about some of the specific things and also about the framework that the Public Health Law Center functions under. So we'll take a little break. We'll be back right after this message.
kitchen surfaces, utensils, and hands with soapy water. One in six Americans will get sick from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. Welcome back. We're talking about public health law and its impact on the overall health of Minnesotans and Americans with Doug Blanke, founder and director of the Public Health Law Center at the William Mitchell College of Law. All right, Doug, you were talking a little bit about drinking and driving, a you know, huge public health issue and individual behavior, don't drink and drive, that message. But what are some of the, the th underpinnings from a legal standpoint that actually help reduce the, the drunk driving deaths because they've dro dropped dramatically and I don't think it's all just because of individual behavior. Well, drinking and driving is a really good illustration of the interplay between public policy and individual behavior change. So that for us to get serious about drinking and driving, which we treated in a much more cavalier way a generation ago and which we now take very seriously, um, to get to where we are today took a combination of legal approaches as well as cultural approaches. So we got very serious about enforcing the laws on drinking and driving, laws that had been on the books for mm -hmm. a long time but weren't enforced as seriously. Um, we increased the penalties and the consequences for violations. And along with that, we developed cultural ideas like the designated driver, for example. And the net effect of all those things together was to change the social norm. So it's no longer considered something that we just turn a blind eye to or wink at. Um, if we're out with a group, there is an expectation that someone will be the designated driver and that you don't drink and drive. And that's really the ultimate goal of these public policy changes, is to change the cultural expectations, the social norms, if you will. We see that with smoking, for example, that, that um, 20 years ago it was considered radical when smoking was eliminated on airlines and today... Oh, it was even radical when we eliminated it from hospitals. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And, and today you could almost dispense with those laws. If we um, got on an airplane and someone were to start smoking, all the people around them would, would insist that they put out the cigarette, they'd shame them into it. So, so that's our goal, is to get to that kind of change in the culture. Yeah. Well, I know you did a lot of work on tobacco, but I understand you're now going into a few other things. In particular, you had mentioned one, you know, the, the trans fats and, and what we eat. Right. And, I, and, and we have an obesity epidemic, and people are saying, you know, if people just ate right and exercised, we, and we will get out of that crisis. But I think there are some other issues behind it. And we have this slide from CDC that, that I'd like to put up to kind of show how things have changed and so maybe individual choices are a little bit more difficult than they used to be. So explain what's going on with this slide. Well that's right Ed. We are working on um, many different types of policies aimed at trying to do what we can to turn around that epidemic of obesity. A lot of those policies are focused on what we eat, others are focused on helping people to be more physically active, giving them the opportunity to do that, encouraging them to do that. Um, and so within that context, there are many different, different factors that people are looking at, but um, up near the top of the list are the unhealthy kinds of food choices that people make for a variety of complicated reasons, and we're really just in the early stages of sorting all of that out. Probably up at the very top of the list for uh, many of the people working in this field is the overconsumption of sugar beverages. Mm -hmm. Soda, but not just soda, um, sports drinks with added sugar, even vitamin enriched drinks with a lot of added sugar. And those have been identified as the single largest source or category of um, added calories that we're taking in as Americans. And there are various reasons for that. One of them is the great increase that we've seen in what we define as a portion or a serving of, uh, this is true for sugared beverages, but it's also f true for things like um, fast food, hamburgers, and so on. So the slide that you have, again, this was put together by the Centers for Disease Control, but it illustrates what we've seen in really uh, an increase of three or fourfold in what we consider a single serving, whether it's... The, the norm of size the, the has norm, increased. Whether it's a uh, serving of French fries or a hamburger or soda. I think about um, old advertisements that I've seen for sodas back in World War II or when I was a child. You know, there are ads from World War II that show the soldiers in the South Pacific having a 
Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. and they were eight-ounce bottles of Coca-Cola. Or maybe you've seen those old ads of the, the jolly, um, not very skinny Santa Claus, mm -hmm. you know, with a bottle of Coca-Cola in his hand, and it's an eight-ounce bottle of Coke. And back in those days, Coca-Cola even had an advertisement that said you could get a 16-ounce bottle to serve three people. Well, today, um, if you go to a vending machine and get a bottle of soda, it's likely to be a 20-ounce bottle, maybe even a 24-ounce mm -hmm. bottle. So we've, um, we've redefined the new normal. So why has that happened? Well, it's a combination of things. I think um, marketing is one of the great drivers of the change in our eating habits. You know, we, uh, in this society, we spend a billion dollars a year advertising and promoting soft drinks the, the, and, and but sugar the super beverages. sizing actually and, increased and, profits for and, the, the businesses well in a way it does it's this it's this idea of convincing us that we're getting more mm. for our money because the added cost to the manufacturer or the retailer of those extra ounces is really nil uh, compared to the the money they're sinking into the marketing and the facilities and so on so for an extra penny or two they can double the size oh. of the cup and so we get the impression that we're getting a lot more um, for our money. Well, you, you brought along and this glass full of sugar cubes. Tell us about that. I did. Now, this is just an illustration of what you're getting when you think you're getting such a great value. So if you buy what has now become kind of, or, or we're in the process of maybe defining as the new normal bottle of soda, uh, 20 ounces, what people are less aware of, if they think that's a great value, is that when they buy that 20 ounces of soda, they are getting the equivalent of about 16 sugar cubes with each bottle. And when you think about the fact that we're now taking in a lot more soda than we ever did, when I was a child, mm -hmm. a soda was not something you had on a daily basis. If you had one a week, that was probably more than usual. And yet today, people might be having more than one of those 20 ounce sodas. So if you, if you were um, ingesting this many sugar cubes in a day, or maybe two of these, in a day, and you did that every day for a week, every week in the month, every month in the year, um, that alone helps us understand why we would have an epidemic of obesity. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the Public Health Law Center and sort of its organization and how it's been functioning and how it relates to local public health and other agencies, but we're going to need to take another little break. We'll be back right after this message. Average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Welcome back. We're talking with Doug Blanke, founder and director of the Public Health Law Center at the William Mitchell College of Law. Doug, when did the Public Health Law Center get started? We've been around for 12 years now, so we started in the year 2000. We started with a focus on issues related to tobacco and health, and today, as our name implies, we work across the entire field of public health, but we really focus on issues related to preventing chronic diseases like obesity and um, tobacco-related disease. Right. Now, are you the only public health law center in the country, or are there multiple public health law centers? There are a number of them. We're one of the, the largest, and we do business, so to speak. Uh, we work with people from coast to coast, but there are a number of them. In fact, there's a new network called the Network for Public Health Law. Mm -hmm. We serve as the coordinating center of that network and work with regional offices at the University of Michigan, the University of Maryland, and Johns Hopkins University, another one at the University of North Carolina, and another one at Arizona State. Mm -hmm. So everything we do is really done in a collaborative way, which is the style of all the work that's done in public health, as you know so yeah. well. So how do you interact with you know, local agencies, or like, like Clearway, Minnesota, which uh -huh. is you know, working on tobacco, or the State Health Department, that's which right. is working on a variety of public health issues, or local public health? How do you interact with those kinds of organizations? Well, people, probably, people in the general public 
probably would never hear our name because mm -hmm. we work behind the scenes. So um, we are a law center, but we don't go out and sue people. We help people work on public policy, but we don't lobby. We work behind the scenes. So we will work with a local health department or a state health department. We'll work with a community coalition or the American Heart Association, for example. And we will provide them with the legal expertise to work on the policy change or strengthening the policies that um, are in place in their community. So we might help them write that proposal for addressing trans fats in Cleveland, or we might help defend the Cleveland trans fat ordinance that's now in place. We recently um, wrote a brief in the Ohio mm -hmm. Court of Appeals to defend Cleveland's law. We will work with the local attorney to help them implement and enforce those laws once they come into place. So it, it takes place behind the scenes, but we bring the specialized legal expertise so that the um, goals that they want to achieve are translated into the legal terms that will work, that will survive in court, that will be workable in practice. So do you do some proactive work of figuring out, all right, how can we use the law to advance public health as opposed to, you know, all right, yeah, we're going to write some, some laws that everybody know about, it. but are there some unique ways that you can suggest public health agencies and community organizations and coalitions explore some new avenues of, of using the law? Absolutely. Our work is kind of a mix of what we might think of as reactive mm -hmm. work and proactive work. The heart and soul of what we do is helping health leaders um, solve the problems that they encounter and that's the role that we really hold um, foremost in our work. But out of that experience we can then identify recurring problems, things that need to be addressed and we will try to address those proactively. A major part of our work involves um, research, competitive research grants that we receive from foundations and so on that allow us to kind of try to think ahead and identify new options for people. So an example would be that we're currently working on a research project looking at child care regulation, child care centers around the country to see which states allow local jurisdictions to regulate mm -hmm. child care and to find, find jurisdictions that are using that power to address the questions of what do children eat when they're in child care? What kind of physical activity do they get? Um, do they spend all day in front of a television screen or a computer screen? And how can we use that legal authority? What are the best practices that could be adopted coast to coast? Hmm. So what are some of the successes that you've had in, in your efforts over the last 12 years or so? Well, um, we're probably most proud of the work that we've done on smoke-free policies across the country where we work with local advocates and the national advocacy organizations and in states like Minnesota where we are now smoke-free people may think oh well we've solved that but in fact there's still many states of the country that are mm -hmm. still working on that issue so we're proud to have contributed to probably hundreds of local ordinances in the smoking arena. Um, we have been working with organizations like the school system in Boston to get all tobacco out of Boston school settings or the city of Austin, Texas to get their parks smoke free. We are working with um, jurisdictions across the country on food procurement mm -hmm. standards for schools and so on. So we're proud of all of those uh, yeah. ventures. How are you funded? Well, we're funded through a combination of grants from charitable foundations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and we've um, had support from state health departments, the Minnesota Department of Health, thank you, <laughs> Commissioner, um, but health departments in the states like North Carolina, North Dakota, the state of New York, uh, the Centers for Disease Control, and then nonprofit organizations like the American Cancer Society. Right. And, and you, know, you said it sort of had been a little niche uh, in the law field. Has it helped change the, the perspective of law schools in terms of what they're teaching and what they're training? Uh, are they starting to see that there's health in all of the policies and all of the laws? Um, it's beginning to, and that's one of our long-term object, objectives for the Network for Public Health Law. We work very closely with the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota, and we see that change taking place in schools of public health as mm -hmm. well, where they're beginning to teach um, public health students about the importance of law. Yeah, well I know, I know the Institute of Medicine said the core functions of public health are assessment, assurance, and policy development. You know, recognizing that you know, some of the screenings that we do and some of the programs that we do are really important, but the policies are also very important. In exactly, today. and good. we're right in the middle of that intersection. Right, good. Well Doug, this has been very helpful. Uh, thank you for all of the work that you've been doing and uh, we'll 
I won't tell any lawyer jokes because you're really helping us out. <laughs> so thanks, Thank you thanks so for much being for that. With us, <laughs> Thank you. And I'll be back with a closing comment right after this message. Full life measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are the number one killer of children 1 through 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. I've been a physician for more than 40 years and have treated thousands of patients. I've saved some lives and have helped many people protect, maintain, and improve their health. Yet, as good as my efforts may have been, they pale in comparison to the impact of the public health laws that have been put on the books. For example, the Freedom to Breathe Act of 2007 has saved thousands of lives and positively affected the lives of millions of people. That single piece of legislation has helped more people quit smoking than I could have in a hundred years of practice. It has kept more adolescents and young adults from beginning to smoke than any clinic-based education program ever could. And it has reduced exposure to secondhand smoke for everyone in this state. Similar benefits have accrued from many other public health policies related to things like fluoridated water, seatbelt usage, clean air and water standards, drug safety requirements, and many, many more. One-on-one -on -one care is important, but a much bigger impact on our overall health comes from the enlightened and science-based public policies that protect and improve the health of large groups of people. That's why policymakers need to hear from their constituents about how important it is to consider the health impacts of every piece of legislation and about how important it is to use enlightened public policy to improve the health of everyone in this state and in this nation. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you can join us again next time on a Public Health Journal.